happened there. So, thank you. Good morning, dear Mr. President, Mr. Joran Parson, uh, Mrs. Mia Petra Kumpula, member of the European Parliament. Dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to our last Think Forest event of the year on a timely and important topic, the role of forest bioeconomy in climate policy. At the same time that we are sitting here, the COP24 is meeting in Poland, as you know, discussing and trying to agree on the implementation guidelines to reach the Paris Agreement. And it is coming in a time that we have learned that global carbon emissions are on the rise again. And it's coming one month after the IPCC published the IPCC report on global warming 1.5 degrees. And in that report, the IPCC highlights the impacts that we are already seeing of a planet that is one degree warmer in terms of extreme weather events and the increased impact of natural disturbances as we have experienced this year with forest fires. And the IPCC report also states that in order to stay below 1.5 degrees warming, we need to accelerate the decarbonization of our economy, of our infrastructures, transport, and cities. And that needs to decarbonize our economy in order to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And failing to do so, it means that it will require additional efforts to remove carbon from the atmosphere through increased or enhanced carbon sinks or carbon capture technologies. And the same week that the IPCC report was published in October, the European Commission also published the updated EU bioeconomy strategy. I think it is a visionary document that places the bioeconomy at the center of a climate neutral Europe. Uh, is a document that also emphasizes the, the key development of the bioeconomy as crucial for decarbonizing Europe's economy. And in fact, last week, the communication of the Commission on the EU's long-term vision for a climate-neutral economy was published, where the bioeconomy is also identified, identified as a key pathway to decarbonize Europe's economy and to, to meet the Paris Agreement. So it is quite clear that the bioeconomy is increasingly visible, increasingly recognized in climate policy. Also, our forest for a long time has been recognized as very important carbon sinks to mitigate climate change. However, sustainable forest management, especially the potential in maintaining and even enhancing our forest carbon sinks resilient to climate change, have not been fully addressed by climate policy. And we need to remember that European forests are predominantly managed, and EU forests forestry and forest wood products represent a climate change mitigation effect of 13% of the European carbon emissions. And in our studies, we estimate that such climate change mitigation effect could be brought up to 20% with the right policy incentives. 
But to do that, we need a strategic, ambitious, and holistic approach towards European forests. And of course, we need also a science-informed dialogue because we are addressing a complex question. And science is needed to avoid transforming a complex issue into a complicated problem. And Joran, you remember that uh, three years ago we went together to Paris to present and discuss the role of forest and forest bioeconomy as means to combat climate change. I think since then the, the mood for global cooperation to address the problem of climate change has changed. In 2015 we were living in a complex world and I think now in addition we are living in a complicated world. So I would like to invite you to to share with all of us your reflections on the situation, your hopes and fears about the issue of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And um, a few reflections. I have participated in um, all the big UN environmental conferences since 1972, that was the first one, in Stockholm. I was young and I believed very much in the United Nations. That was something. And they put the problem on the agenda, no doubt. Something happened, yes, most linked to biodiversity, I think. It was important. Then the next conference, it was in Rio, 92. It was not about climate change. It was more about uh, local action, how to combat the environmental problems on the local level, Agenda 21 and uh, other important documents. Then next time we met, it was 2002 in Johannesburg, uh, roughly the same type of agenda. And then came climate change as the most important topic for those conferences. So in Copenhagen 2012, it was about climate change. In Paris 2015, and now in Katowice, it will be about climate change. So it is a long, long story. And uh, my impression is that um, the action on the ground is not responding to the bold uh, documents presented and decided on these conferences. The opposite, I must say, the last five years, it's going in the other direction there is no sense of urgency today in the public debate. Yes, among those who are engaged, yes, but among ordinary people and uh, politicians. You can even see that in big, important countries for this huge challenge of climate change, in big, important countries, it is possible to be elected today promising to start production of coal or increasing the oil production. And they are elected. And now we are in front of uh, a new government in one of the most important countries on the globe regarding forestry. If they sh will start to use the forest in Brazil again in an unresponsible way, then we have a new situation. This is taking place and meanwhile, we are meeting and uh, deciding upon different documents. And this is something that sends you a signal about the new political situation we are living in. A populist never have a holistic perspective. He can't have that or she can't have that. A populist, they are asking for something else the very easy, simple solution, quick fixes, and uh, it will cost nothing for you if you support me. The holistic view is something else. When I read the document from the Commission about the bioeconomy strategy, it is a holistic document. 
There you take everything into account. It is not so easy. It's not black and white. You have to be realistic and you have to judge about different things. So it is a useful tool. That's my opinion. Some governments will be extremely active. Others will not be. But there is one new pattern emerging compared to the situation 72, 92, or 2002, whatever you choose as a reference point. And the new situation is that the commercial society, um, the business society, is more and more focused upon sustainability. Because their customers, those who are active, and knowledgeable, they are asking for products with no carbon footprint. That is a strong force, and that force can be something that will take this important work to the next level. After having participated in all these international conferences, I ended up as a farmer, uh, and I live that life today. It's a very good life. Of course, in combination with traveling around the world, giving lectures about almost everything, and also some activities in different boards of both small and big companies. But I like to say I am a farmer, and I'm living on a very beautiful farm outside Stockholm, and we are producing meat, and we have a forestry activity, fishing and hunting. It's beautiful. I'm living my dream. But it is organic, it is certified, and I am, as a producer, paid from the end customer for my products just because they don't have any carbon footprint. And they pay well, I can tell you. And they are also people who are building the opinion about the next development phase in the society. They are often well-educated, they are young, and they have their own children to take care of, and they are responsible for their upgrowing. And therefore, they want to support this type of production. They are important, extremely important, perhaps more important than politicians when it comes to the end, how to shift this new, this, this challenge into something that is an advantage. I am also chairman in a very big company, not always uh, the best from an environmental perspective. I am chairman in a company producing iron ore, the biggest in Europe. It's an extremely big company. But we are also now forced in that company to produce the next generation of carbon-free steel. We have just started the project to produce steel in the northern part of Sweden without any carbon footprint at all. And if that will be successful, and we think we will be able to carry that out, then we have contributed with something that is an answer to our customers, because our customers are those who are selling cars or fridges or whatever you can see in front of you using steel. And they are meeting young, well-educated customers who say, we want to have a product with as low carbon footprint as possible. If we, want, if we shall buy your car, <coughs> how have you produced the steel used in the car? And then we can answer, it is from our production, no carbon footprint. If we are successful there, this is the single biggest source of carbon emissions in Sweden. And we can eradicate that if we use the new technology and if we are successful. Because of the demand from customers on the field. This is much more powerful when perhaps a newly elected president on the other side of the globe. This is something that can't be stopped. This is something that will continue to grow. It is perhaps in the business society. 
And in combination with that, when you see national governments under pressure, it is often uh, a sign of something new, a formative period. And the new also bring more of local decision making. I am very glad when I follow the mayors of the 400 biggest cities in the US. They have a corporation and they say we will continue combating climate change. We will continue to develop our public transport system. We will continue to develop a life that is, a life that is better for our inhabitants. They are the force on the local level or on the regional level. Even if the Washington decisions will go against all climate change agreements, there will be definitely so that the next generation of transport technology will be developed in California. So it is a very mixed picture we can see. The local response is something that local politicians have to deliver because they meet those who buy my products at my farm. This is the new pattern emerging and therefore I'm quite optimistic. So when we meet today in Katowice, we will have important decisions, yes, but perhaps the most important decision today is a young mother who say, I will not buy that product because it is not environmentally friendly. It is not combating climate change. And I want to see products of that kind because my children belong to the future. There you have it. No politicians have been able to answer to this yet. Perhaps they will emerge, perhaps. But meanwhile, this is taking place. And then the question is, will we do it quick enough? Will we be able to deliver quick enough? I am of the opinion that we will because the alternative doesn't exist. We are just forced to do it. And as long as we can find the positive measures and uh, the good initiatives, it is a quite pleasant journey forward. It's a question of modernization. That is also a word used in this bioeconomy strategy from the European Union, modernization. And that is also an argument we can use against those who say that climate change is not a problem. Okay, I accept your position, I don't share it, but let me modernize the society because that is in the interest of our all and the future. So it's a very important document from the Commission. It's a very important initiative because it paved the road for those who want to take action locally, and that is important. And we are using our forests, and we are hopefully also using our agriculture sector, one of the biggest and most important business sectors in the world and a strategic asset for every nation and for every group of nations. This is the political backdrop to today's discussion. Sometimes I am a little bit pessimistic, I must admit, but when I meet those who come to my farm and ask me if I can supply them with the good and healthy products, I realize there is something new emerging and it is coming from the ordinary people, the well-educated young population, that gives me reason to be optimistic. Welcome. Our host. Honorable Chair, Jaran Parson and dear Director Mark Palacci, it's a very Delightful to be here in the same uh, residence palace as uh, some events we have been here together. I think this residence palace, it used to be a high-rise house with the people living here and cinemas and others, and now it's changed to be something uh, in the middle of the busy, busy European quarters, these weeks especially busy. So it shows us that there is a change 
And I want to also emphasize and start by saying that we need to change. We need to adapt, but we also need to change, and it goes throughout the, the society. And it's a great honor to continue uh, after Parshan's great word from the historical perspective and seriousness what is happening in the society. So I think the climate change presents a profound challenge to new life, way of life, uh, in, and it's also uh, taking part uh, everywhere on the uh, globe. A recent report from the IPCC showed that the climate change is already here. And it's, that's why I think it's so uh, uh, difficult to understand some people still arguing against, because we saw it, the results last summer, we can see the extreme weathers, and, and uh, that this already one Celsius is uh, producing more extreme weathers. Forest fires in Sweden woke me up. I used to study the uh, Forest Institute studies on Spain and Portugal, and now it's reality in northern parts more often as well. So um, I want to stress, also stress that there is hope, there are results, and there is a lot of knowledge that we have to now use to make this change. This Sunday, uh, here in Brussels, 65,000 people gathered to demand more climate action. And on uh, a study published last week, Finnish people said that climate change is the number one they are worried about. It went over the terrorism and uh, other uh, worries in societies. So climate change is very much of the European issue as well, but we do have the support from the Europeans. Overwhelming 92% of the European thinks that the climate change is a real serious problem. Europeans also think the European Union should, alongside with the national governments, business and industry, uh, lead the fight uh, on the global warming. This is what I will take with me to the Katowice also next week as a part of the parliament delegation. I hope the people have uh, placed uh, in a political system and stakeholders to solve this problem, to tackle the climate change and save the planet. So, dear friends, European Union has taken this uh, challenge seriously. EU has been uh, at the forefront of the global climate negotiations, and it should continue. It also has made sure its own house should, is in order. The clean energy packets, it's from my uh, per, uh, MEP uh, uh, glasses, uh, I've been like, working a lot on that, has been a big challenge for decision-making system. Eight legislative proposals from energy performance to buildings to the electricity market design, and I hope, think that some of the very last trilogues are taking place in these days. Now, that's just a bit over two years since the Commission published these legislative proposals, and we can say that the clean energy package will indeed take Europe to the cleaner uh, future. European Parliament has constantly pushed for high, um, higher ambition and clear, clear binding targets in order to make sure we won't miss the opportunity and give a clear signal also to citizens and businesses on, uh, for investments, so what we expect it to happen over the next years. However, tackling the climate change is not fire and forget type of exercise. But now we are done, we are ready, and then let's move on. It is not that uh, everything is done yet. Uh, let's have, uh, or could say that let us rest on a few years and take another look later. Tackling climate change is here, and it's everyday work. It's a core of our policy making, so process needs to be continuous. I think it's a great uh, uh, paper from the Commission that it presented the, us the idea of what could lead Europe to clean, net zero future life. Arthur Runger Metzer from the Commission is here and will present us the uh, strategy more in detail. But let me say I consider strategy to be the very good beginning for the future discussions. I'm also happy to note that the bioeconomy plays a role. It's not very clear every time said from the Commission in the big papers, but now I think it's taking that on board. Nice way. Many political parties, European Parliament, several member states, as well as industry and NGOs have supported clear, ambitious targets. We now had that proposal from the, one of the net zero to, to by 2050 target. What we need now is a serious discussion how to get there, including by updating the midpoint targets in 2030 and 2040. I think that would make the way even more clear. 
Finland, my home country, will hold the EU presidency in the la later half of the next year, and I hope my country could take this issue up with the other member states and continue progress um, very uh, fast and solid path. So, dear friend, unlock this path uh, to net zero Europe by 2050. We need some keys. And by keys, I mean technologies and industries which will show the way and enable other sectors to contribute as well. Bioeconomy is one of those keys. So first of all, products from the bio-based raw materials help us to substitute fossil-based products. It is an economic model where the effects to the nature are increasingly decoupled from economic output and creation of well-being. When our economies are designed in a circular manner with bio-based renewable materials at the core, they become cleaner, less dependent on foreign imports of oil and other fossil raw materials, and they present a great opportunity for innovation, jobs and growth. And secondly, bioeconomy serves as preservation of our planet important carbon sink, especially forest. Active forest management, for example, enhances the absorption of uh, CO2 to the forest. As we heard from the beginning, it's a challenge, uh, opportunity to even increase that from 13 to 20 percent in Europe. Active forest management also makes our forest more resilient to the negative impacts of climate change, such as forest fires. For there to be active forest management, we need an active and thriving bioeconomy sector. We can constantly develop new ways to better use of wood, material from our forest, including wastes and residues, which is in a circular manner should also be used. I, who follow and meet people from the forest industry almost weekly, I learn something new every day, what they are planning and looking for. The latest was batteries. Not yet, uh, but they're in the, to be in, in 10 years, maybe. So, um, some of you might ask, isn't this contradictory? Or is she trying to have a cake and eat it too? Uh, of course, we need commonly agreed ways to do the sustainable use of forest. The LULUCF regulation tries to do exactly that, and I'm glad that the legislation could, be, uh, could have been enhanced during the trilogue process. And I'm happy to remind also that the new category of the fo forest storage was included there. So also to uh, enhance the role of the wooden buildings and the use of the long-term uh, wood uh, storages. Other coordination measures and strategies, most importantly the revision of forest and bioeconomy strategies by the Commission will help us to define the best direction for the bioeconomy. And lastly, I have to point out the bioeconomy is not about the burning wood, the energy, that I do see here too often uh, asked or commented. It is about sustainable making the best use of the nat natural resources while all at the same time contributing to fossil-free economy. That requires innovations, and this is why I urge everyone to support the increased funding for the bioeconomy research in the next MFF and in Horizon Europe. Uh, Dear friends, I want to thank European Forest Institute uh, and the Chair Joran Parson for this uh, timely uh, seminar. The discussions here are an important part of the dialogue that is needed in order for Europe to continue to lead the climate change uh, global efforts. Uh, in Katowice next week, uh, I hope to see there that the global community can agree to concrete next steps as well as clear rules and guidelines on the implementation of the Paris Agreement. From today, I will take there the important message of the forest, how their active, sustainable management can help us and achieve the climate goals faster. In the climate change, we have underlined the uh, serious uh, message from the scientific life, and I said that we must believe in science and, and knowledge. So do I want to underline, it is the same with the forest. We need research and science, how to make the forest to be part of this whole big process that is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri. And uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, um, now we continue with uh, our seminar, and we have three interventions. And we start with uh, Arthur Runge Metzger, Director, DG Climate European Commission. 
Take the floor, Your Excellency. And you have promised also to answer questions direct after your intervention because you are on your way to an important meeting. Welcome. Yes, I hope that my presentation is not going to take that long, um, that we still have time and I can listen to some of the other interventions as well. Um, I have little to say today because Mia Petra probably has said already half of it, uh, which is uh, that we put a proposal on the table called the Clean Planet for All, and that is a long-term vision, not just to save the climate, but also to have a prosperous and modern, Joran, you have mentioned it, modernization is at the center of it, and to be also competitive um, in a globalized world. Um, what I want to do is a little bit go over what we have just decided. Again, Mia Petra has said a lot on that, and then come to the 2050 strategy and then end with some conclusions. On the climate policy side, um, all the proposals that were on the table of the Parliament and the Council were decided um, already. And the big three pieces we are always seeing as the three pillars of European climate policy, emissions trading, it's the so-called effort sharing where we have transport, um, uh, households, buildings, waste and agriculture, and the commitments of member states. And then we have LULUCF, land use, land use change and forestry, for the first time as a pillar in the European climate policy until the year 2030. And each of them has their particular objective, what to achieve. On the land use, land use change and forestry side is to have end up with no debits. Um, and it was mentioned that 13% of the emissions are currently being captured um, by the forests in Europe. Um, if we look at forward in terms of what is the task ahead, uh, you see the solid line on the left-hand side. That is how emissions in Europe are developing. And you look forward to the year 2030, the at least 40% target compared to 1990 and the target path, which is the red dots here. And then you also see what member states at the moment are expecting how their emissions are going to evolve in that time. And it, you could say, yeah, it looks good until 2024, 2025, but then I think there is a problem. So member states will have to be active and do more, and also the companies and the households, the cities, the municipalities, if we really want to achieve our 2030 target. So the glass is half full, that is the good message. If the glass is half empty, that is the challenging message until the year 2030. Um, if we look at the land use, land use change and forestry emissions, that's just looking back on how it's developing. You see it here, the dark line, that is kind of what the forest is absorbing. It's around uh, 400 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, and some say it's declining a little bit um, over the last years, but we would hope that we can keep that potential because that is important if we want to move into the long term. What are the next steps that are foreseen, particularly when it comes to forestry? Uh, member states now have to do a national forestry accounting plan uh, that has to be delivered by the end of this year. Um, and that will also have to determine what the so-called forest reference level is going to be. So how the managed forests are going to evolve between 2020 and the year 2030. And on the right hand side, this just a symbolizing line illustrating uh, what we mean by the forest reference level. And all of that will have to be part of a much wider national <clears throat> energy and climate plan that also will have to be delivered by the end of the year um, by the different governments as a draft. And we will have next year to discuss that among the member states, but also with stakeholders outside governments. I think that was very important for the parliament, was insisting that this discussion cannot take place uh, behind closed doors. The public will have to be invited to discuss these plans. Hopefully, Röran, with uh, the enlightened ones, helping to push forward uh, and bringing their views much more strongly into the debate also in Europe. Now come to the vision 2050, the longer term. What should we be doing after the year 2030? And many have mentioned it already. We met at the beginning of October in Incheon. 
um, in order to discuss the uh, IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. And what is very interesting and encouraging in the report is that it says, yes, something can be done in order to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there's different pathways leading to that, and the IPCC puts out an illustration of four different pathways. What is very clear from those four pathways is that by the mid of the century, emissions and removals will have to start to balance. Uh, and I think that's something, it's one of the core sentences in the Paris Agreement, that this is really the longer term vision. Of course, one can question which of these scenarios or illustrative pathways is the more realistic one. Take, for instance, the one on the right-hand side with the big yellow below, which means there is a lot of negative emissions which either have to be captured in the vegetation or through carbon capture and storage. This um, illustrates about 1,000 gigatons until the end of the century, which is something like 220 times the annual emissions of the European Union today. And I would think that maybe that is a bit far-fetched to believe that this could work, knowing very well that many people in Europe are very skeptical about carbon capture and, and uh, storage. So if you look at what we have been looking at from the Commission side, it is more around the P2 scenario, so there will, be, will have to be a limited amount of negative emissions, and particularly capturing or using vegetation to capture that carbon from the atmosphere and store it safely in that vegetation. And then maybe there is a limited space and need for the CCS in the true sense in terms of putting carbon into geological strata. So this is the view of the climate neutral European Union. Um, and if you have read carefully the last slide, that was to, uh, for the globe to be carbon neutral. While Europe is saying we need to be climate neutral, uh, which means for us that all greenhouse gases will have to get to net zero in the year 2050. And that is the kind of vision you can see here, what different sectors can contribute. The yellow one, for instance, is the power sector. And already, if you are around 2040, we will see almost complete decarbonization or reducing emissions almost to zero in the power sector. But what you can also see is that many of the remaining emissions will still be gone from your farm um, because there is the cattle uh, that does the things you can't stop them to do. Um, and these emissions will have to be balanced, but there the forests can help. And even there, in the year 2050, we are not talking about a single solution, a single pathway, a single blueprint, but there is choices to be made. And, Johan, you were very right in saying that, yes, consumers can play a major role. You see the two bars on the right-hand side. These are two different visions on how the 2050 world could look like. On the right-hand side, it is with the very enlightened consumer who also makes choices and changes his preferences, um, which means we will have less emissions, particularly from agriculture. So uh, there is not that much to be balanced um, in the year 2050, which would make it easier. But you could also go down a more technologically oriented option, that is the left-hand bar, where you still have quite a significant amount of the red, the carbon capture and storage in the system. And that is something that will have to be discussed in the coming months and weeks with people in Europe. So how does it look in terms of the plan that is behind it? In actual fact, it is a huge investment plan. And here you see the calculations for how much investment we will need to see in Europe in order to realize that plan. Of course, these are rough estimates. These are not figures um, that we know uh, in very much of a detail. But if you want to stay at 1.5, at the climate-neutral climate Europe, you have to spend, in addition, between now and 2050, something like 150 to 300 billion euros every year. That sounds like a big number, particularly if I compare to my monthly paycheck. 
Um, but if you look at it in terms of gross domestic product, we talk here about 2% of gross domestic product. Um, we already every year invest into our economy about 20% of our gross domestic product. So we talk about a 10% increase that is required, an effort in terms of investments. But investments, as we know, is going to create also economic growth. So if you look forward in terms of the development of the GDP in Europe, you see here the red and the green lights, these uh, lines. These are two different estimates of the same thing. This is how the climate neutral Europe would look like moving towards 2050. And the dotted line in the middle is what is the baseline if what we were to do the same as of today. But there's a little caveat here because these lines do not take into account the damages that came, come with climate change and it doesn't take into account the adaptation costs. So the dotted line will come with a significant amount of climate change and it will come with a significant amount of adaptation costs. So it's probably going to be at a lower level than what you see here. In any case, the message is very clear. In the year 2050, we expect Europe to be two and a half times richer than we were in the year 1990. And it is following the same trend that we have seen already today since the year 1990, because that is what we have been doing over the past years, decoupling emissions from our GDP growth. And the message is we want to continue along the same path. Sometimes when I listen to the climate discussions, it is like, yes, we have to do less. We have to, um, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. It's not true. At the end of the day, in terms of our wealth, it's going to continue to increase and we will have mobility, we will um, have our food, we will have our clothes um, and even in a better way in future than in the past. Vision 2050 also means that we have to have a very close uh, look at the material flows. And it was mentioned several times, the green lines here show how biomass is being used in the economy. And that is already in the year 2016. Looking into the future with an increased bioeconomy, this effect will become stronger in terms of biomass. The bioeconomy for the 2050 vision is going to be a major part and also to make the economy much more circular than what we have today. So this is the kind of starting point from which we are going to start to build the economy of 2050. Bioenergy feedstock um, on the left hand side you see what was produced in the year 2015 and towards the right these are the scenarios of going lower with the emissions and the last three bars here uh, show how a 1.5 degree uh, scenario for Europe could look like. Again, there is some variation on how you can construct that world, so there is some choice, policy choice to be made, which path you are going to go down. But very clearly, you will use more biomass in the future than what you did in the past. So, Joran, your business is going to be preserved for many, many decades. So it's not that you will go... Preserved, it will continue to be extremely strategic. Indeed, <laughs> it's a strategic investment and strategic work you are doing there. And it is very different parts. Uh, you can see here uh, the residues from paper and pulp. Um, you see the forest, the forest residues, uh, but also agriculture in terms of lignocellulosic grass and also shorter rotation coppice are going to play uh, an important role in the year 2050. So these are the, this is the vision in, with the red circle. It will also mean that uh, the biomass can help to fuel mobility. Um, you see here liquid biofuels, you see um, biogas playing an important role in the fuel mix in the year 2050. Again, there is more business for the foresters and also the farmers in the future. But then we will also have to enhance the removals. Today, I said we are around 300 million tons. If you look at the 1.5 degree scenarios, again, you will see that we have to at least preserve, but um, probably to enhance those things in the future. And that means we need to have business models on how do you reward the farmers 
of stocking up carbon in a safe manner. Uh, this is something that the current policy does not fully provide, but that will have to be part of the future as well. Conclusions, new business opportunities will be there plenty, whether it's the biofeedstock, whether it's the advanced biofuels, whether it's substitution in terms of the building materials, the harvested wood products, Mia Petra, as you were calling them. And we need to increase the capabilities of land and forest to store more carbon in the future. Uh, and that can be done by improving the management of the forest. And if I listen to the European Forestry Institute, there's still many ways on how that can be done also in Europe, not only in Brazil. Sustainable soil management is something where we can improve. Um, and we can also improve afforestation. You might have noted that in some of the graphs, afforestation is going to play an important role if you want to increase the carbon stocks in Europe. Finally, and you should not see this as an afterthought, we will have to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. I was recently in Slovakia and in the Czech Republic, and they have been telling me um, how much their forests are being affected by climate change through pests and diseases. Uh, and that is something, of course, that is not being really taken into account in these models. It's very hard to predict. But we will have to watch that very carefully in the coming decade uh, and what to do in order to make sure that the forests are still going to be there uh, and that we don't have the pests and diseases moving forward. So all of this is a vision at the present point in time. All of this will have to be discussed with stakeholders. We want to have not only the discussions, as I mentioned, in the closed room here next door in the European Council or on the other side of the hill in the European Parliament, uh, but it also needs to go to the Committee of the Regions. It needs to go to the Economic and Social Committee. And this debate will have to be taken to the capitals in Europe to engage national parliaments in order to decide what is the way we want to take this whole idea, this vision forward, because there is choices to be made, and many of them are going to be political choices, not only choices of individual consumers. Thank you very much. And now we have the opportunity to put some questions to Arthur. Please, go ahead. Crystal clear. If not, please. Does it work? Yeah. I think the, the question is, ah, okay. um, what is the okay. effect of afforestation? Because it will also, may or might change the albedo effect of the landscape. Um, kind of the models we are looking at in this context are socio-economic models. So they will not take into account these albedo effects. But we rely on you, Elma, uh, that science is going to give some answers um, to that question on con whether there is some feedback mechanisms um, on this. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. My name is Piotr Borkowski. I come from the European State Forest Association here in Brussels. And then my, my, I have two questions, one related also to afforestation. And then uh, the question is whether the Commission has made a kind of assessment of availability of the land for afforestation, because we are talking about a very long time perspective, 2050, uh, if we consider afforestation a significant factor. And then I wanted to come back also to the issue of adaptation to climate change and also, especially when assessing the costs uh, related to, 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 to the implementation of the strategy, uh, isn't it not uh, isn't it not too risky not to include into the assessment the costs 
of adaptation, but also the cost of this uh, increasing occurrence of this um, weather phenomena caused probably by the climate change. You mentioned the pests and diseases, but also like almost every day now we've been informed by our members, large uh, managers of state uh, forest areas about, for example, the damaging storms. And it's not only like the issue of Bavaria or Poland or Slovakia anymore. This is also north of Italy and other countries, Slovenia. Thank you. Yes. Starting with, the, the, with your last question, uh, yes, that is important. Um, but we have, in terms of the um, analytical capabilities, there are some limitations there. And if you look at what has been done on adaptation and uh, looking at climate damage, you um, are um, looking at huge Quite, or quite significant uncertainties. Uh, and what uh, we rely on is very much kind of case studies at the moment. Uh, we will have to invest more in order to better understand and to do what is called integrated assessments, where you look at mitigation and adaptation at the same time. Um, but we are not yet there. So therefore, I have to put the little caveat there, but it's something that is going to be very important. In terms of the land resources, yes, I think it's in this exercise for the first time we have looked at it very carefully in terms of where do these land, uh, these hectares come from if you want to a forest. So there's um, areas that are not being um, fully utilized at the moment where you have shrubs growing and so on. So there is a possibility of expanding forests into those areas. And then there is a limited amount of agriculture land, um, which is more the marginal ones uh, that might also move towards uh, forests. So there is still land available uh, in Europe in order to also help with afforestation. One more question. OK. Thank you, Artur. You, uh... Now we are also looking forward to the next phase when this document should be implemented and become the new reality. We are all looking forward to that. Thank you. And now you also have some time left to be able to listen to our next friend, and that is Elmar Kriegler, Vice Chair of Sustainable Solutions Research Domain, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Elmar, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, and thank you for inviting me to this um, event. Um, I guess my, my role is um, to uh, spend a bit the, the broader picture, meaning global, and, and also looking at the entire system. Uh, I myself uh, have been an author of the 1.5 degree report in Chapter 2, Mitigation Pathways. So uh, our task was really to, to look into the available literature uh, on mitigation pathways compared to well below 2 degrees with the 1.5 degrees. Uh, and then uh, draw conclusions on the, on the scope of the challenge. And as it was pointed out before, it is a big challenge. And we are looking here, and I will show this on slides in a minute, really on uh, if you want to stay below 1.5 degrees, uh, we are looking at a, a transition that is unprecedented in scale. It, it is very fast, and it means it requires the contribution of all sectors um, and all countries. Um, and, of course, the bioeconomy will play an important role. So let me jump in, into my presentation. Um, and I'm showing you here, um, let me start with the basic story of, of the, uh, in this case, two-degree mitigation pathways. Um, this is the blue, uh, the blue funnel you see up there. And you can compare it with the development uh, that would uh, take the NDCs and then try to extrapolate the level of effort that is reflected in the NDCs, these nationally determined contributions um, that are, have been submitted under the Paris Agreement for 2030. The basic difference is um, the, the blue path goes to net zero uh, carbon uh, at some point. Um, while the others is just stabilizing CO2 emissions, which is 
not sufficient to stop global uh, global warming, which is a very important uh, thing to to, know, uh, to recognize. Now, if you look at the underlying dynamics in these pathways, and these are pretty generic, so the details matter, of course, and uh, the Commission has presented the mid-century strategy with a lot of detail, and it's a very, um, I think, useful document to to understand a lot of questions to be discussed and to go into the necessary detail. Here the generic picture is um, in order to really be able to reduce emissions globally, not only um, stop their rise, um, we need to uh, direct investments much more than we do right now um, in various sectors in the economy. And only if there is a substantial change in the investments, um, and that's uh, one effect. The second one is an increase also in, uh, in overall investments, much going then to low carbon. We can really establish this uh, rapid decline of emissions you see after 2020. A lot will be about power sector decarbonization uh, in this phase. Phase out of coal, um, um, not only in the power sector, but in other sectors, um, because in many regions of the world coal, uh, coal is used, also in the residential sector, but also in industry. This is an important uh, discussion. And here biofuels, of course, can play a role. Um, this needs to be integrated with um, decarbonization of transport, um, there are some bottlenecks here that have been um, also addressed or, or raised, uh, freight transport, aviation, shipping, heavy industry, though these are really decarbonization bottlenecks where we need to think of, of new uh, technologies. Joran talked about uh, uh, um, carbon neutral steel, so that would be a major innovation um, if, this, if this comes about. And in the end, in this strategy, we, we uh, have even net negative CO2 emissions. Many of these pathways show that. So they, they have two uses. One, one use is to compensate excess emissions earlier to come back to a budget that would be compatible with well below and uh, 1.5 degrees. That also would imply some overshoot. And there's a huge discussion to what extent we can allow that. We need it. We want it. And the other one is also to compensate some other long-lived greenhouse gases from the agricultural sector. Uh, and Arthur pointed out that the Commission wants to go not only carbon neutral, but um, emissions neutral by 2050. Now, this is the same picture where I add the 1.5 degree trajectory in green. So if you look at, at, at this um, picture, and I'm flipping back and forth, you can see qualitatively it's, it's similar, right? but it's all going much faster. So here we now really have carbon neutrality by 2050, um, not by around 2050, uh, 2070 as in the uh, two degree uh, strategy. And then we have uh, more carbon dioxide removal in these 1.5 degree scenarios. Now let me talk a bit about the role of land in these strategies, both 1.5 and two degrees. And the land is critically important. Um, for both strategies. Even though um, the majority of emissions uh, comes from the use of fossil fuel um, uh, for energy services, the role of land is critically important. One is, of course, the land use based emissions. You can see this figure here where we uh, did a study and compared baseline and mitigation case. Uh, and half of that comes from non CO2 um, uh, agricultural emissions uh, right now. Um, and then another half from, from deforestation. And this needs to be, as you can see on the left-hand side, needs to be phased out or limited quickly. So the fact that Bolsonaro now in, in Brazil has been elected president is a major threat to this strategy of reducing deforestation um, because um, they were on the way, even before Bolsonaro came into power, one could see an uptick, uptick in deforestation in the Amazon. And, the battle on deforestation is, is really uh, um, uh, yeah, a key player is Brazil here. So there's reason to, to be concerned. So one important role of land is, is greenhouse gas emissions reduction. The second one is carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere and also storing carbon um, in the terrestrial biosphere. So this is one of these rather extreme scenarios uh, um, that uh, uh, Arthur also showed as part of the report, and um, I fully agree um, this looks rather an unrealistic strategy to remove the bioenergy and CCS so much uh, of the carbon, but there are other options to uh, remove carbon from the land, and I will talk about this in a minute. Uh, but 
maybe a third option not on the slide, and this is brought up here in this um, uh, event, is, is um, the usage of wood or bio-based products in the economy is replacing other products that are fossil intensive. I think here we need more research and really understand what's the potential of that. And there might also be some, other than wood, there might be some other products that might be relevant here. Now let me quickly show you one figure from the uh, 1.5 degree report, which is basically taking up what I just said. Um, and this is this figure, SPM, in the summary for policy makers, uh, figure SPM3. So in the report, we looked at um, uh, 1.5 degree scenarios of two types. The one type you can see in the blue funnel, these are uh, uh, um, pathways that would uh, stay below 1.5 degrees or limit warming to 1.5 degrees with a small overshoot, while the one in the gray uh, already have a larger overshoot of the 1.5 degree target and, and then would come back to 1.5 degree by the end of the century. You can see the difference. We admit more in the short term in the gray funnels, and then we go deeper in the long term. So we really have this trade-off between now and, and tomorrow. Um, and we are right now, of course, uh, not even on the trajectory of this gray uh, funnel. Um, actually, the report makes a very strong statement and says um, that if we take the current national determined contributions on the table, um, the unconditional ones, we come out at around 52 to 58 gigatons CO2 equivalent in 2030 from the literature. If you take the conditional ones into account, it's around 50 to 54 gigatons CO2 equivalent. This is twice as much as we uh, have in these, in these pathways, in these blue pathways, uh, which are around 25 to 30 gigatons CO2 equivalent. So we are really uh, far away from these 1.5 degree pathways, and the report says clearly um, that if we follow the NDCs until 2030 and we end up with 50 plus gigatons CO2 equivalent, we will cross the 1.5 degrees. We might be able to come back later if we use a lot of carbon dioxide removal, but we will cross the 1.5 degrees. So um, it will be interesting in Katowice to see what, what the countries will do with this information, because if there is no strengthening of NDCs until 2030, uh, the 1.5 degree will be crossed. All right, so Arthur has shown this um, uh, slide before. It shows the variation. Even though the challenge is, 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 is very large, um, it is, um, uh, there is some variation. And you can see, particularly the land use differs across those those pathways, and they are not born equal. If you look at the right-hand one, this is a, a large overshoot pathway. Uh, so um, it's, it's not from the climate outcome, not the same as the other three. But there are some trade-offs here, how much you use uh, uh, different types of, of carbon dioxide removal strategies on land. Um, so if you look at these carbon dioxide removal uh, strategies, we do have um, uh, the classic one, which is afforestation, soil carbon enhancement, use of biochar, and land restoration, which are all playing um, um, in the uh, on the land uh, and also are part of the bioeconomy considerations, I think. We have those that try to um, really um, capture the carbon and sequester it in geological formations, so bags using energy crops is, is one frequently discussed. We do also do have algae um, here in the mix, and that is rarely discussed about, but I think something that needs to be explored more, because algae doesn't have this land trade off that bioenergy would have, or also afforestation would have. Um, and then we have um, strategies that uh, um, use those captured carbon, um, wood is one example um, that, that we can use in products, but there might be other routes, like, for example, for carbon fiber, which I think is important to explore. So different types of storage, if you look at these technologies, and that's also important because these types of storage come with different um, uh, permanence issues. Um, I think mineralization is something that has no permanence issue because it takes it away, but both geological storage and terrestrial storage do have permanence issues, and so it's a, it's a question of, of governance here also, how we manage that. Um, and if we look into our scenarios, there's also difference in timing between these options. So afforestation or um, soil carbon enhancement, these are options that are, uh, can be deployed rather quickly, while for the others, which are more technology uh, laden, it might take more time until they can be deployed at, at scale. So in many scenarios, they are then used more in the latter half of the century, meaning they are also used for different purposes 
they don't help us so much to get to zero carbon because they come late, but then later they could help us to, if we overshoot, to come back down. But really valuable are those technologies that can come in early and can help us to get to zero carbon by compensating some of the residual fossil fuel forces, sources. So um, let me, um, I'm not, I, I would, would need a signal how I'm doing on time because I don't want to overstay my welcome. Okay. It's okay. Um, I have two, or two more slides and then, then I'm done. Um, so this is a picture that thinks about this, this world in 2050 um, where, we, where we think about carbon neutrality. And uh, Arthur had a similar picture up there for 2016, looking at the, the flows of, of the materials and of the fossil fuels. And I think that's something we need to do now, do a visioning for 2050. How can a, a carbon neutral economy actually look like? You have uh, on the left-hand side the classic things that we um, do use fossil fuels. We combust it, it goes into the atmosphere. We can capture some of that CO2, put it back into geological formations. We can substitute it, um, or we use uh, some uh, removal technology uh, from the atmosphere. But this is a very limited picture. We need to think more about uh, the right-hand side here, where we use uh, um, uh, this, this CO2 in products. This is carbon capture and usage. Uh, one important issue here is, of course, is that, that if you use it in products, what happens after the lifetime of the product with this carbon? Is it released back into the atmosphere or is it stored away safely? Is it recycled? And that's something we need to uh, think of. There's a definition in the summary for policymakers in the 1.5 degree report of carbon dioxide removal where storage in products is explicitly mentioned, but it's also said durable storage. So wood that later on is then passed back into the atmosphere because it's, it's, it's burned would not, uh, would not um, be in this sense carbon dioxide removal. However, if you look at this upper uh, cycle, there's carbon capture and cycling, where you basically are carbon neutral because the carbon you use, you burn in synthetic fuels, for example, is actually taken from the atmosphere and not from the geological reservoir. So thinking in this picture, I think, will be very helpful. Now, finally, a few words on the sustainable development dimension uh, of um, these, these pathways and also the, the, the land component in there. Um, there is, of course, we all know the sustainable development, um, the Agenda 2030 with the 17 SDGs. Um, and we increasingly do this modeling to not only inform climate mitigation pathways, but also the larger uh, set of sustainable development goals. We've written a report in this project, The World in 2050, I give the link below, um, that was also submitted to the high-level uh, political uh, panel. In, and, and presented in New York in, in July. So this is something emerging now really to look into the trade-offs and synergies between these SDGs. I give one example for the sustainability of land use-based mitigation, and this is uh, now for, for the use of bioenergy. So this, I will come back to the first on, on my last slide after that. Um, but but uh, in bioenergy, um, you, what you see here, we have different categories to assess um, the impact uh, on sustainable development. One is, of course, the CO2 emissions we get from a, uh, from a certain strategy or pathway. Then the nitrogen um, um, uh, loss or nitrogen uh, waste, the nitrogen deposit into the environment, which is an important consideration. The water use above uh, environmental flow constraints, so the, the really the, the unsustainable water use here, and the impact on food price if we have these trade-offs. These are categories to measure sustainable development effects. So what we did in this study is we looked at a scenario where we wouldn't deploy uh, any bioenergy, globally is that is, that's the black one, and looked at the, um, um, at the value uh, in these four indicators, and we had a scenario where we uh, deployed 300 exajoules of bioenergy, uh, so that's a lot of bioenergy, and you can see it has major impacts. There's a lot more emissions from land use uh, because of the land conversion. Um, there's more nitrogen use, it has enormous water footprint, and the food price index increases. Yeah, so, and then we looked at different strategies to, to limit that effect. We can uh, re limit the um, deforestation. So then we are doing well on the, on the land use change emissions in the upper left. But if you look at the food price, since the pressure on land increases, the food price increases even more. We can um, use uh, uh, um, nitrogen more effectively. We can uh, try to protect the water resources, li limit this. 
um, we can try to increase the productivity of land, and it all has impacts. And if we combine everything, we actually find a point, a sweet spot, where um, we can limit these sustainability effects. And this is the basic message that with uh, intelligent system um, uh, wide perspectives and good management, sustainable management, this can work out. But it requires a lot uh, on, the, on the policy making and governance. Finally, last look on the afforestation side. So the left one you have seen already on the bio, bioenergy, we also did a study on afforestation. It has a very large land demand. Um, and depending on how much land you use, the effect on the food price, which is shown in, in uh, here, uh, can be very, very large. So again, here, there needs to be smart concepts how to, for example, recycle the wood that you take from, uh, from this uh, forest and, and really store this wood away so that you can regrow the forest on the same patch of land to limit the land footprint. All right, so, so far, uh, from my side, um, I would like to put a plug in here for um, uh, a project we do on scenario communication and visualization. So if you're interested how these scenarios emerge, how they are basically conceptualized and what elements are used to bring them together, you can uh, look at this nice primer there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Elmar. And um, is there any questions? Someone? Something you oppose or want to know more about? This is, after all, the seminar, ladies and gentlemen. You have to put some questions there. Mia Petra, please. Yes. Uh, the question again uh, on the same land, but more uh, wood production on the same land area, or better agriculture on the same la land area. How much uh, would you say on that one? That's a tough question. Um, yeah. uh, wood production on the same on forest the same. area. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just commenting on the various land uses in order to think of if we want to um, sequester the carbon stored in the wood, we can, if you uh, double the, 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 the wood production and we have a use in products that really stores it away, that's great because it enhances the potential of carbon dioxide removal per, per area of land. If you think of um, uh, um, keeping the forest there, we could think of harvesting it at some point. And if you don't have products, where we can uh, uh, store it away, then the question is whether the wood can be buried or something. Uh, so there's a lot of um, ideas that can play in this area to increase per patch of land the amount of carbon that can be reduced from the atmosphere, taken from the atmosphere. It's not easy. Oh, any other questions? Thank you, Elmar. Oh, there was one, one more. Back, okay, please. Philip Heide-Peter from the Leibniz Association Brussels office. Um, simple question, is there any reason to be optimistic and are you optimistic, you as a scientist especially? Thank you. A reason to be optimistic about climate uh, mitigation? About, yeah. about reaching all the targets? Yeah. Um, you know, I think optimism is not the right category here. <laughs> Because I, th I think uh, Jovan said in the beginning, uh, it's not about what we can do, but what we have to do. And I, I just think we need to work on this continuously um, and um, not in the sense of hope for the best, but really to, to make it happen. It doesn't matter whether we are optimistic or not. We just have to do it. And if we wait too long, it will be impossible to handle the development. So it is. Okay, the last question then, Elmar, please. And then we have the next. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Daniel Wagen. I, um, I have a clarification question in terms of the scenarios and the modeling, if you looked at particular regions or the globe. Um, and related to that, is there any findings which suggest we should do one thing in one area and perhaps prioritize other things elsewhere in other regions? And I'm also thinking uh, of the comments made around what's happening in Brazil, 
um, about the climate negotiations and the concepts of trading credits from forestry. Um, and so curious to your thoughts on that. Right, uh, good question. So yes, there's uh, regional patterns to that. There are different uh, potentials, both um, land, uh, copier potentials, land area, but also on the energy side, different resources. Um, and um, I would say uh, when it comes to to use of the land forest uh, afforestation or deforestation, it's a major issue in the, in the developing countries, uh, particularly in the tropical regions. And here, a huge benefit uh, could be achieved if, if deforestation is stopped. Um, and it's, it's all about governance. And um, I'm, if you ask me what would be my proposal for, for, for managing this, I, I would have to admit I, I'm not too deeply into this discussion. I, I don't know, but I, I know that there are a lot of initiatives trying to solve these problems, working with the governments. It's Indonesia, it's, it's Brazil, two major players here. It's, of course, the Congo in Africa. And um, so it makes a lot of sense to, to invest there. When it comes to, uh, to Europe, I do believe, I mean, Europe also has a lot of force in the Nordic countries, for example, yes. So uh, having um, advanced bioeconomy technologies being developed is definitely interesting. But I do believe we should uh, also think further and, and think of options like algae and then uh, think of technologies that could really bring, uh, bring this in the direction of, of carbon fiber materials and, and looking for things that can actually replace cement and steel. Um, uh, and, and that would be very innovative. I think that would be something for Europe to, to look into. Okay. Uh, then we have to say thank you to Elmar and uh, welcome the next speaker, Pekka Leskinen, Professor, Head of Bioeconomy Program, EFI. Please. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Jöran. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. And in this presentation, so my role is to uh, explain a bit uh, on the main conclusions, main findings that we did in this, this report that actually you all should have a paper copy, copy already published last week on, on, on Wednesday. Uh, uh, we started this work about at the beginning of this year and then actually we had a very, very very high level, very international research group of people working in this, this project. We had a researchers from Germany, Spain, Austria, and Finland, and then actually outside Europe, we had our chance to cooperate with one researcher from USA and one from Canada. So I was very happy, happy to work on this, this, this topic that has an international interest as well. So starting from the beginning, that why we did this study? What, what, is, the, what is the main driver, main motivation? Well, of course, we all can agree that the climate change mitigation in the context of climate change mitigation, forest and the forest sector has an important role. And I think that we can also agree that that role is, is even more important tomorrow than it has been today or yesterday. Uh, but the issue as such is, is quite versatile. We have, a, we have a forest that act as a forest carbon sinks. I think that that part is quite well known. Uh, we also quite well know that the forest uh, or the wood products can act as a carbon storage. We talk about harvested wood products and carbon stored in, in, in the products. But that then at least in the general discussion, the third uh, possibility to use forest sector in, in climate change mitigation is, is related to substitution. Uh, and substituting uh, more greenhouse gas intensive material. I think that this is the area that uh, we, our knowledge is, is perhaps the weakest compared to the last uh, or the first two ones. And that's, that's why we thought that we need, to, we need to update our current scientific understanding on, on this topic. And especially taking into account that the last uh, systematic review in this field was published about 10 years ago. So we, we, we clearly see that uh, a lot of things has happened since the 10 years and we need to update, update our information. And of course the main reason for this is that we want to, want to utilize the forest resources as efficiently as, and as optimally as possible. And it, in practice, it means that we have to have to take a so-called holistic view in this case. We have to consider what happens to forest and the forest carbon sinks. And at the same time, we have to consider the impacts in the techno system and what are the, what are the carbon footprints of different, different products. And we have to, have to try to understand this big picture. Otherwise, there's a clear risk that we, we will make an optimal decision. And this is not that we want to do. We want to be as efficient as possible. 
So very briefly, the more concrete aims in, in the study that we had. First, first issue to remember is that we actually only basically made a literature review. We didn't make any new calculations, new modeling, new technical analysis, although I can admit that we, we developed a couple of new ideas on this, but uh, this is not the forum for that. That was a literature review based on existing scientific knowledge. That, that, is, that is what we are now talking about. We were a little bit discussing that how these so-called substitution or displacement factors, how, how those should be kind of uh, assessed and measured, but mostly we were considering what the scientific literature says, that what really are the magnitudes, magnitudes of, of mitigation, mitigation impacts of certain, certain products and product, product categories. <coughs> that was the literature review part. And then actually in addition to that, we, we also tried to have some sort of idea that what about that if we take a certain sector like a construction sector and we, we want to upscale that, uh, that we, as a starting point we use the, the uh, mitigation impacts or displacement factors at, at individual products and then we want to upscale that how about that what could be the overall impact if we want to go to the level of, level of markets like a construction markets in Europe type of questions. And then, then uh, finally, finally we, we spent quite some, some time to think about that what really are the uh, kind of a take, take home messages on, on, on in the field of decision making and policies in, in, in this context. What, what should we think about these uh, displacement factors? Uh, I'm not going to go into, into technical details, but I will take only one issue that is a kind of a technical, a technical tool, but I think that this is, this is the important, perhaps the most important issue that we have to take into account when we make this type of assessment, and that is a life cycle viewpoint on, on products and production systems. We have to, have to consider that what are the emissions of production phase when we are comparing wood-based products and non-wood-based products, what is the emission difference? Then, then we have to consider the use and maintenance phase, uh, same type of comparison. And then perhaps one, one of our a kind of a third of this life cycle phase called cascading in this, this case, that what are the effects of recovery of materials from end of life products. This is something that, that, that links very closely to circular economy and, and keeping, keeping the materials in the loops and closing the, closing the loop. That, that is an important area. And then also the end of life, that what will happen at the end of life of a product uh, whether, whether we use energy recovery or what, whatever might be the option. And it is important to remember that actually all of these phases can be important. You, you don't know what is, what is important in given certain, certain products that you are looking at. You have to make assessments and calculations and then you know, then you know that what is important and what is, what is, what is not. But in, in potential, all of these should be taken into account. Then uh, I have some, uh, some PowerPoint slides on, on, on the results that we made. The uh, first slide is uh, kind of a descriptive uh, information. Uh, overall, we had a certain rules how we selected the studies. You can find the details in the report if you are interested. Uh, we we, uh, we take a, took a closer look, look on 51 different studies and then we then we analyzed more than 400 different substitution factors that we found in the literature, so more than, more than 400. And the uh, left-hand side picture, you can, <clears throat> you can see that uh, uh, from uh, which areas these case studies that we were evaluating, they actually came from. And we can see that most of the case studies came from Northern Europe, countries like Finland and uh, Sweden and Norway, for example, or in addition to that, many, many of the case studies were related to the United States or Canada. And this actually has a one important message that we, when we want to generalize the results that uh, we have to take into account that there were no hardly any studies that were explicitly related to Asia or Africa or Eastern European countries. So this means that we have a big risk of, of biased results if, if we don't take this into account. We need more, more studies in, in, in these regions. Second, second picture, right-hand side picture, is related to different life cycle phases that, that these studies considered. All of, all of the studies considered production phase. Uh, uh, most of the studies considered end-of-life phase. But again, we can see that hardly any studies whatsoever that, that were taken into account the cascading, potential cascading impact. So this is, uh, again, one, one important issue that we should come back, come back in the future and consider that what really could be the cascading impacts. 
briefly about the about the sectors that these studies were looking at. Most of the studies, uh, almost all of the studies, were actually related to somehow to construction, either structural construction or non-structural construction. And again, here is a one important message that if we, if we want to want to consider what could be the most interesting areas on the top of the construction, of course, most interesting areas of future development of, of bioeconomy, potential mitigation impacts. Uh, then we could talk about uh, potential in the, in the chemical industry, potential in the packaging and textiles. And again, we can see here that there are not too many studies in this, this, these important, important new emerging fields. We need more, more work on that side. Then about the materials uh, that were substituted, well, this is uh, of course co consequence that because most of the studies were related to construction, then the materials, materials that could be substituted were related to cement, concrete, ceramics and stone, so this is a natural consequence on that. Uh, then about the numerical, numerical uh, results uh, that, that we got, and uh, first, first uh, message here is that you have to be a little bit careful when you interpret these numbers in, in policy making. There, there were a lot of uncertainties, variability, details can be found in the, in the study, study that you have, but that just to illustrate what could be the magnitude based on the recent literature. Uh, we had a structural construction, non-structural construction, textiles, other categories, and then average across all of these uh, categories. And the, and the first left-hand side column, this is now the so-called substitution or displacement factor. It's a bit complicated measure, or it might look, might look like a bit complicated measure. It's a, it's a measure that what is the emission difference of wood-based products compared to non-wood-based products when the emissions are measured as kilograms of C, which is the carbon, carbon content of, the, of those emissions, and that is divided by the kilograms of carbon in the final, final food product. And uh, uh, we, can, we can see that the structural construction has an average, average in this that is 1.3, non-structural construction a bit higher, textile were the highest in, in our case, and the average across all these product categories were around 1.2. This average is a bit smaller compared to some of the earlier reviews, but there are some natural reasons, reasons for that. And then uh, if you quickly check the uh, right-hand uh, side column that we actually uh, transfer this displacement factor into a unit that might be a little bit more easier to understand. For example, the average 2.2, the bold number in the, in the bottom on the, on the right hand uh, column, uh, that means that what is the, uh, uh, what is the uh, corresponding uh, CO2 uh, reduction in the, in the, of the wood based product measured in kilograms of CO2 per kilograms of wood. Product. So that is uh, the scale is a bit different, but the message is basically basically the same. And here you can see that if the average measured, uh, as I just described, is 2.2, we can we can see that uh, that 95% uh, of the observations or the displacement factors that we were looking were in between minus 1.3 and 9.3. So the variation is is very large in in, in this case. But uh, that's the that's the way it is. This is the scientific understanding that we have currently. Then, uh, as I mentioned, the second, uh, uh, perhaps even more challenging, challenging issue that we, we want to want to also to understand understand that what the impacts might be at the level level of markets. And then we we took uh, some pieces of information in this picture. We have a we have a production in EU 28 2015 on certain categories measured millions of tons. And then we have plotted uh, a couple of substitution factors connected into, into these, these categories. And here the, here the uh, key message in this picture is that if we want to have a major scale uh, climate substitution impact of forest products, we should basically have two issues. Issue number one is that we should have a sufficiently large uh, market volumes. And then secondly, we should have sufficiently large uh, displacement factors. And then it, when, when we multiply these two, then the outcome is, is something that can be important in terms of climate change mitigation. And here we can see, for example, that uh, when it comes to dissolving bulb, uh, uh, that has a sufficiently uh, 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 or quite large substitution factor, but then the volumes currently 2015, they were missing, but if the volumes would increase, that could be an important, important overall impact. 
Then on the other hand, uh, sectors related to, to packaging, for example, the volumes are there, but then, then we have a very, very weak level of knowledge that what, what could be the displacement factors because of the large variety of different type of products and, and, and lack, lack, lack of studies and data. So this was the uh, 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 quick uh, scanning that we did in the report, and then, then we were able to, able to take uh, six different uh, uh, key messages based, based on, on, on this study. And the, and the message number one is that uh, actually the, uh, the, uh, the use of wood and wood-based products is associated with lower fossil and process-based emissions when compared to non-wood products. In, in the data that we had, it was a bit more than 90% of the cases, the substitution factors were positive, and that means in practice that uh, wood-based products uh, had a lower fossil and process-based emissions. Second message is that we, we produced a new average, average on, on the substitution factors, 1.2 kilograms of C uh, divided by kilograms of C. Uh, message number three is that actually, uh, and this is an important, important question, that now if we want to, want to, want to uh, 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 build up new policies for climate change mitigation, then our message is that substitution is an important issue that should be taken into account, but that as such is you cannot, cannot use that as a basis of, basis of policies. There are forest carbon sinks, there are uh, issues related to disturbances, uh, forest fires, pesticides, uh, many, many, many issues that should be taken into account, and then the one, one uh, market-related issue, potential carbon, leak, carbon leakages as, as well. But, uh, but uh, substitution is, is one of those topics that you have to, have to consider. Uh, message number four, uh, uh, resource efficiency and minimizing material waste, they, are, they, they make sense independently of, of actually with the, which type of products we are talking about. Uh, we, we, we can have or we, we have tools to, to improve the uh, carbon footprint of forest-based uh, products by, by, by using resource, eff resource efficiency and, and minimizing the material waste or closing the loops. Then message number five is that we have actually a big gap or lack of knowledge of climate change impacts of, of different emerging new products. We need new studies, new analyses, uh, when it comes to especially textiles, textiles packaging and, and, and chemicals. And then finally, my last, last message is that actually, although, uh, of, of course, climate change mitigation adaptation is one of the critical issues. We have to also take into account the other sustainable development goals and try to try to avoid avoid uh, trade-offs and and concentrate on synergies. And in this task, I would I would say that the sustainable or the actually responsible consumption of production is one of the key issues, and that's why why this substitution also can play an important role in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Pekka. Is there any question to Pekka? This? Uh, yes, Sylvia Menegari from the Sumel industry. A lot of European policy are now focusing on long-term strategies or so looking into the future 2050. And many sector, as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Person has uh, recalled at the beginning of his intervention, has already committed in being carbon neutral. One of the sector, for example, is the steel industry. But the cement industry is also uh, committing to this uh, carbon neutrality. So I would like to ask, uh, if other sector will really achieve their carbon neutrality, are we still going to gain with this substitution effect, or the number will drastically change and probably the comparison won't be the same anymore? Thank you. Uh, very, very good question. You're absolutely right that, uh, that if, if other sectors and, let's say, the energy production behind the uh, different, different te technological processes will be emission-free by 2050, that clearly has an impact, impact on this substitution or displacement factors. But, uh, but the main issue is that our kind of uh, main target shouldn't be to maximize the substitution factors but to minimize the emissions. And it, if that will happen, that is just actually the way that we should go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Minima, minimize, the, minimize the emissions, yes. And the wood you are producing in your sawmills, they will always be competitive. Perfect material. Ah, 
and one more. Okay, thank you, Pekka. And thank you for this part of the seminar. Now we go into the next. It's a discussion led by Professor Hettemäki. Please take the floor, Lauri. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we go to the more interactive part of the Think Forest, and this is the panel discussion. What we have already seen in the presentations today is that there are some great challenges ahead. You also see that there are possibilities for bio-based products. But now what we would like to discuss is what are the actually the policy needs that we need to enhance the, the development that uh, we would like to see in the future. And today we have an opportunity to have uh, five excellent panelists here. And I will invite them in turn to, to the floor, starting with uh, Dirk Gares, uh, who is the director of the Biobased Industry Consortium. Please, Dirk. Then we have Katarina Knapton Fierlich from uh, the Commission responsible for public procurement policy. Please, Katarina. Then we have Christine Lange from the German Bioeconomic Council. Please, Christine. And then we have Linda Rosen from Limpex Group. Limpex is a Swedish uh, uh, company building multi-story houses out of wood using advanced industrial technology. And then we have uh, Daniel Chimmer, a director from Climate Geek. Please, Daniel. The way that the panel is, is run is the following. I ask each of the panelists to provide one slide before to me without showing to the others. And now I would like to show each of the slides one in a turn and ask all the uh, panelists to comment that slide. And we start with the, uh, with the first slide. Uh, are the panelists able to see the slide? I, I think you have it in front of you on the desk. So please, if you have a, a third time, to reflect on, on what is there in, in, in the slide. Basically here, I just shortly comment that uh, uh, this slide recognizes the different role that the bio-based products contribute in terms of, uh, of the uh, sink uh, uh, storage and substitution. And then there are several seven policies that are, are recommended. And, and I would start by Daniel to ask you to, to comment what does this bring to your mind, the slide? Just a few main ideas that you would comment. Do you agree with them? Is there something that you would uh, really like to emphasize that is most important? Or, or what type of ideas do you get from this slide? Is it working? Yes. <coughs> Um, in Climate Kicks, we believe that we, we need to work on entire systems and to address these systems in, in different ways. Um, so w when I looked at, yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm just discovering, uh, of course, the, the slide, but uh, um, what I feel is interesting is to look at these policy dimensions from different perspectives. And as you will see on my slide, we have uh, looked at the key challenges in a way along the, in the different parts of the system. And, and, and we see what main challenges are faced to increase the role of uh, forests in general. Uh, toward the climate change mitigation. So what is interesting in this slide for me is that indeed there is this diversity of angles that, uh, that are taken to work with the different sectors, to work on, uh, on, uh, <clears throat> on different dimensions uh, of, the, of the sector, which is critical to change it as a, as a, as a system. Okay, so very systematic. View. Thank you, Daniel. Linda, do you have any, do you find an interesting uh, issue? Yeah, I think the point that stands out to me is uh, bullet number five, ensuring competitiveness of bio-based sectors. Um, 
um, trying to, to exchange products to more bio-based uh, alternatives will always, um, it's always hard to be first at something and to drive uh, uh, innovation when it comes to something. So ensuring competitiveness by making it easier or more financially attractive um, to find new uh, type of bio-based uh, products uh, will always be very important. So I think that's the one that stands out to me. Okay, thank you, Linda. And Christine. Yeah, um, looking at it, I would say uh, it's um, number four that um, appeals to me most. That's a better accounting for current benefits of bioeconomy. Bioeconomy has still a problem of not being visible enough. And if we uh, recognize that there is a benefit for uh, climate um, mitigation, climate change help in that, I think it also helps to make the economy more uh, visible and enhance awareness of uh, the market and of customers. And I think this could be one key to promote those things. Okay. Thank you. And Katharina? And for me, I'm here a bit like as the outsider. I'm representing the Public Procurement Directorate of DG Grow. <laughs> but what stands out for me is the seventh point then, to boost the uptake in all economic sectors. And that includes the buying activities of the public administration, which amounts uh, to 14% of GDP. So if we do something there, we can do something for the whole of the economy and can... Um, and can contribute, and I think I'd say more to the next slides. Thank you, Katrina. And finally, Dirk, why did you choose this slide? What was the reason that? Well, first of all, um, these are also some recommendations, by the way, that will be published by the European Bioeconomy Alliance, so uh, uh, very soon. And I think I will not repeat uh, all of them, but maybe uh, focus on a few of them. Um, we also have seen, you know, if we really want to uh, tackle climate change in 2030-2040, this means also that we will need to do investments. Uh, and that is why this first one is very important. If we develop uh, policies uh, to tackle climate change uh, or energy, uh, then we need stable, predictable, enabling uh, policies because industry will only invest if the policy is stable for, and, and predictable for a long term. So that's very important because we can make a lot of scenarios, but without the necessary investments, this will not happen. Um, another one which is important uh, to me uh, also is, let's say, well, of, of course, is the, the link to research and innovation. Uh, this will not happen just as such, so we will need a lot of in, to do a lot of investments in research and innovation, uh, but also we have to bring different industrial sectors together. It is not all the indif different industrial sectors on their own that will uh, tackle climate change, but I think the most important is also that different industrial sectors start to collaborate. Uh, and we see this, for instance, in the sector, well, which is present also here, the pulp and paper industry, uh, uh, also linked to the forestry industry, but they start to work with the chemical industry, with the energy sector, with the textile industry. Uh, and these are the new applications, uh, certainly, uh, that are very sustainable and, and, and very useful. But um, in our case, of course, uh, I'm a bit biased, but I think partnerships, public-private partnerships, uh, but with the different industrial sectors are crucial, as well at European level, but also at, at member state uh, level. Uh, another um, important one is, uh, of course, uh, the competitiveness of the bio-based sector. Uh, very important. Again, uh, as an industry, we will not invest if your final products are not competitive. Uh, and that's a bit linked to the last one. Um, how can we boost the uptake of, of, of biomaterials, bio-based products in all economic sectors? Uh, and, and we really have to think, you know, how can we um, uh, support this? And that can be public procurement. But that can also be financial incentives, but also tax reductions, so it's a bit different. Uh, but also creating awareness. And I think um, really uh, involving more uh, the, the brand owners, the companies that bring bio-based products on the market, they really have an important role because they know how to communicate. They, ha they are very close to the consumers. Uh, they really can, can help to create uh, awareness. 
even if the products are maybe a bit more expensive, uh, they really can communicate uh, why it is more expensive, what is the reason behind. So more collaboration with, let's say, the, 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 the end stakeholder in the value chain, the brand owners, is, is also uh, critical. And then maybe uh, the last point, um, that this is about uh, taxation and, 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 let's say, subsidies. Uh, I think uh, a level playing field is very important. Uh, uh, level playing field between the different sectors within the biobased uh, area, between, for instance, bioenergy, biofuels, but also other biobased products. Uh, because we, if we talk about uh, climate change, we focus a lot on bioenergy. Uh, transport, but we forget always um, the bio-based materials, the bio-based products. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, a uh, level playing field between uh, the fossil, let's say, uh, area and, and the bio-based area, because I think there's still a lot of uh, subsidies going to the, the fossil area, uh, which is certainly not the case for, for the, the bio-based. Okay. Thank you, Dirk. And the next one, uh, I don't think for some, it will not be a surprise who is behind this, but I will start with uh, Linda. What would this bring to your mind? If you think about Linbex being a, a wood production industry, do you find any issues that would be relevant, perhaps, for your industry related to this? Well, from the market where I'm active today, which is Sweden, um, there's a lot of uh, rules and regulations about public procurement, but none of them have to do with sustainability. So I think that is a, it's a big potential. That, that, um, that's the national law, no? <coughs> yeah. I guess you're referring, not the European. No, the national, yes. the national yes. laws. Okay. So that would be a, a factor to, to focus on. Okay. For us. Daniel, what do you think? Is obviously one of the key levers uh, for innovative solutions. Well, actually, it's often a barrier to innovative solutions, but could be then used uh, uh, to to try to push for 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 new materials or new solutions. Uh, we in, we also we we work a lot on this because we feel that uh, there are indeed areas where barriers can be removed and where pro public procurement needs to play a role to facilitate the deployment of, uh, of innovative solutions. So it's at the same time yeah, a big, an important barrier, but can become also a very important lever. For instance, working with cities um, who are uh, at the moment launching programs for, for wood construction or wood isolation, there you can really have a, a quite interesting leverage uh, impact. Okay, thank you. Christina, Chairman by Economic Council, are you discussing yes. about public procurement? Yes, actually we are, and <clears throat> we also suggested to the German ministries to, to look into that. So uh, I, I think this is a key factor, so you're not the odd one out here. I think it's, it's very important to, to have this. And the reason I see is that most of these innovations start small, like all of the innovations, and they have to compete with big industries, with established production pathways and if you enable um, by this or help them to get marketplace or that is there it's much easier to, to scale up and <clears throat> only once you scale up you can get into production costs that are competitive so this is absolutely important and also come back to my first point it would also help to um, um, to raise awareness for these products because how can you procure something that is not kind of standardized and labeled? And as today we have lots of labels, but not the one that really directs a consumer to, to buy a certain sustainable and bio-based uh, product. And I think public procurement could be key to facilitate all of these things. Thank you, Christine. I'm sure, Dirk, that your consortium is supporting also public procurement policies, but what would be your exact expectation for, for that? Area? I think indeed <clears throat> per procurement can be uh, important because if we can create a market and, and increase the demand. Huh? Uh, and I think in the States we have a very good example in the United States, the, the so-called Buy Preferred Program, which is really a an, an, an public procurement program, but focusing on bio-based products, uh, also with the label, with communication, uh, and focusing on bio-based products. Uh, 
Uh, and that's quite clear. And of course, in Europe, it's a bit different because we don't have a procurement program for bio-based products. It has to be linked to, let's say, uh, yeah, so sustainability or greener. Or, so it's a bit hidden, let's say, the, the bio-based uh, aspects. Uh, um, and that's one of the difficulties um, because, uh, indeed, per procurement, you need also need to create awareness. You need labels, uh, which is also still missing uh, at this moment, and you need standards. I think in the area of standards, we, we're making progress. Uh, but certainly, it can help. But Europe is a bit different than the, than the United States. Uh, the the by preferred program is at federal level, and it can also be used at state level. Of course, in Europe, it's more fragmented. Uh, we have, uh, let's say, every member state, every city has its own procurement program. Uh, and we don't have really an, an European-wide uh, procurement uh, program. Uh, so the impact is a bit more difficult, uh, and especially if it is when it is also more, more hidden, let's say, the bio uh, aspect. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Uh, Katrina, of course, this is yours, but I would like to comment in a way that I can easily see that the bio-based industries see a lot of uh, advantages with the public procurement policy, but in your slide you're also addressing the buyers and the consumers. And I think that is an interesting challenge how the consumers see that the sort of uh, benefits of and how that is communicated to consumers. Of course you can comment in other ways also, but that is one issue that I would like to hear more. Please, Katrin. Um, well, if um, I'm slightly puzzled because, yes, I'm addressing the consumer, but in this case, the consumer is the public buyer. Okay. So is the authority that actually goes on to buy something? We, well, we as a public administration commission, but all the public administrations within the member states are consumers, and they are big consumers. So I, lots of things have been mentioned by the, by the other four panelists. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy that public procurement seems to have made its way into the, into the consciousness of, of other policymakers that it's actually an important field uh, because we have such a, such a big impact on, on the economy. But then we also have to use that impact in the best possible way. And indeed, we are lacking European-wide programs, but we are not lacking a European-wide um, legal framework, which is already the first um, uh, the first step to have a to have coherent to have Korean policies. And within that framework, we very much encourage sustainable procurement in all kinds of ways, uh, bio-based product, but also other products. And we do issue guidelines to all member states. In the end, it goes down to the last little community municipality. That is similar in the US. In the end, it's a municipality that buys. And the message has to reach the very last level in order to be implemented. And in order to, and that's why we say we have, indeed, there is a supplier engagement necessary. That's what one of you mentioned. You have to, the suppliers have to go and pitch their products to public administrations who generally are no experts mm -hmm. and working under time pressure to deliver within a tight budget. So for them to think out of their normal box and to buy something innovative um, uh, um, and bio-based is not their first priority generally. So we have to make it their priority. Um, we have to we then need for the officials on the ground to have the political support to actually do that because they are talking about often about risks as well so that's where the barriers might come the barriers are more in the head than in the legal framework the legal framework allows for a lot of things our policy priorities and our policy engagement um, promotes a lot of a lot of things and that's what i wanted to quickly highlight by saying already when you define what you want to buy, look look for other products. Look for wood-based um, insulation systems you talked about. Look for other bio-based. Then when you select your company, look at its track records on, uh, in terms of, in terms of um, ecological and sustainable. Uh, and then it decide which company to choose. When you really define your products, 
be specific on what you are requesting in terms of um, a CO2 neutrality or other things which allow innovative, innovative companies to have a better chance to enter the market. And then also pay attention that once you have been promised that by a company, the company actually delivers. Companies often can also um, promise quite a few things and do not deliver then what they promised. But all that needs to become mainstream in every single municipality, and that's a pretty big challenge for all of us together. Okay. Thank you, Katrina. The next slide. Uh, policy needs for sustainable bio-based products. Some challenges in Europe and how policy might help in this. I think we are partly returning to the same issues, but there are some issues that have not been flagged previously. Uh, Dirk, if you think about your list and this list, uh, what comes to your mind as immediately? You don't have to go everything, but just <laughs> if you can pick. Well, I see that. Um, you have a level playing field there, for example. Many of the, of the, the let's say, the, the the proposals are quite similar to what I have also expressed. I think just to focus on, on the different one, which is very important, this transformative mindset, I think, is, is very important. Uh, and that's, to my opinion, is at the level of the consumer, yeah, certainly, but also at the level of the industry, the companies. Uh, and the good thing is that we see that this, this, is, um, this is quite present today, more and more. I think companies are aware that, uh, at least some of them, they have to change uh, also the, the orientation of their business or the way to produce products or the way to, to, uh, uh, to develop products. Um, within, for instance, the bio based Industries Consortium, we see very clearly that, that new companies are coming in that were not active in the bio based area before. Um, and they start collaborations with other sectors. Uh, so uh, this is quite uh, interesting uh, to see. And why are they doing this? Because there is also a growing demand at, at the, 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 the consumer level. Um, to make it very clear, companies like uh, Unilever, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, you know, Lego, IKEA, uh, start to become active uh, in, uh, in, the, in the consortium and in BBI projects. This is because they see that there is an opportunity in the market. And if these companies are active, then we see that the other companies in the value chain are also more interested to invest uh, in these kind of products. So a uh, transformative mindset, I think, is, 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 is certainly um, uh, very uh, important. Thank you, Dirk. Katharina, there's supporting market development mentioned here, which I think uh, could be very much in line with public procurement. But uh, what comes to your mind in, in other respects? Yes, indeed. Uh, also, um, I would, I would uh, side with Dirk. What I rather like is the fact that we propose similar solutions. Sometimes it's good to walk together in, in similar directions. What I would like to highlight is indeed also, that first, the transformative mindset. That's really important for public buyers to get away from cost optimization, to get away from saying, I, saying, I buy the one that right now is the cheapest. I don't care about its life cycle costs. I don't care about its wider impact. And for this, each single individual needs political support that's relative, that's still too often missing in the member states and especially at lower levels. And uh, the second point that actually grabbed my attention was the first on the nudging investment in innovative, innovative enterprises. Um, I do believe that also the public side has has a place to pay, a play, and has to can help uh, the small industries scaling up if they are capable and willing to take the risk to test uh, solutions that are not yet on the market for decades and known to everybody, and that that might help private consumers, but also private companies to take similar risks. Thank you, Katrina. Linda, do you think that your company is in the business of transformative uh, mindset, <coughs> transforming the mindset in the building business? Yeah. Or what, what do you think about this? Um, I agree that we need to get the focus away from cost 
and uh, better focus on sustainability. But I also want to address the bullet that's second to last with demand. Um, it says little knowledge of bioeconomy, but I also think that it's not only little knowledge, it's um, preset IDs that you think that bio-based products are um, less quality, uh, automatically more expensive, um, less, um, um, it's harder to be accepted if you make that choice. So um, I think we also need to address that um, and make sure that, and not address it only as it's a lack of knowledge, it's a mindset that needs to be changed. Okay, thank you. Daniel, do you see a system here? <laughs> yes, I, I see two two points also, which which interestingly correspond also to what Katarina pointed. So the market development, I think it's not only market development, but it's also ensuring a transparent uh, market where traceability of products are better uh, is is uh, is well addressed, and I think it. It relates also to what uh, uh, Linda was, uh, was saying. Uh, it's not only necessarily uh, cost and economy, but it's also look at sustainability dimensions and create a market which is transparent and where these sustainability issues are well addressed. And um, in, in the investment part uh, for innovation enterprises, I would like to ask especially that um, there, there should be a sort of supporting mechanism to, to look at how to increase the value that can be captured for, for a forest. So have a, a holistic, we speak a lot of these holistic approaches, but uh, on what, where is the value and how can we maximize the, the, the value? For instance, at the moment in trees, there are only small parts that are seeds that are valued in many, in many places. So how do we use more of the bark of all, all the, uh, uh, the, the different parts? Um, and also non-timber maybe products in forests because one of the barriers is that uh, forests are not exploited in a number of cases because there is no value chain, there is no often technology also ready to be scaled to capture the, the value of the forest and of the trees. Thank you, Daniel. Christine, this is yours and how, how would you comment your own slide? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, we put together these um, things from recommendations from the German Bioeconomy Council we put to the ministries in Germany. And uh, what we stress at the moment uh, very much, because we see that in Germany what is lacking is money going into um, bioeconomy uh, companies. So the market, um, the capital market ecosystem is not really working for bioeconomy that has something to do with its it's difficult yet to understand the concept, and it's a long-term investment that investor needs. It's not as this, uh, uh, when you invest into a startup that is in a, um, in a, a development or whatever um, um, uh, information technology, you get a much faster a return of investment. So this is very difficult to explain at the moment. So we lack this definitely. So this is one thing. It has also to do with the little knowledge. As we say, it's also investors that don't know much about it. It's also knowledge that is lacking on the bioeconomy bi concept, I would think. Because what we need to explain to more or, or talk about is that what we are looking at is a transformation of um, our economy, so going away from a linear economy to a circular economy, which you reusing things and having almost no waste, which means that we have to change lifestyle. I took from the slides of, uh, um, of um, Elmer, I think, uh, that I, I guess I understood that in all the scenarios also food prices would increase. Yeah, so that's also something we have not been um, talking about to, to public, and I think we have to be honest at that. So it's, it's uh, explaining the concept, but also explaining what the consequences are either way, if we do nothing or we do something. So I think this is uh, the things I take from the challenges, and I would uh, say on the how, what, how policy might help. Um, 
Osh, very important. Um, I, I appreciate that you see that the nudging investments is something that is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, has to be seen. It's also what we see as demonstration projects. We see a number of companies in Germany that are good in the small part, also coming from research. You have ideas, a patent is established, but then there is a gap in investment. You don't get to the demonstration plant. And once you are there, then only, only at that point uh, you can see what the price of a product, and that's what you are asking for if you're asking for public procurement. We need to have a whole process set up, a demonstration plan set up to have, be able to do economics on that and, and things like that. So this fits together, and there is, at the moment at least, we don't see an investor's market on this. So I think that is where policy should help. And also, um, the last but one point, I think, could help um, communicating lighthouses or showcases. Uh, we've asked, for example, the German Minister of Economics just to ask a bioeconomy company when he goes out to uh, different countries and to showcase the German economy, just to raise awareness on that. That would be my main points. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Let me move to a very concrete slide and, and what I think here is interesting, it's not difficult to guess whose slide this is, but I think it's really interesting because it goes directly to a, a, a company slide and, and some very concrete uh, challenges related to policies that the companies are facing. And Dirk, you are dealing with the bio industry companies. How do you see this? Well, of course, this is quite focusing now on, on the construction. <laughs> But um, in, in general, I think that the, if, I, um, if, I, if I look at the second bullet points, the increased use of SCA life cycle analysis, uh, I think this is, this is quite important because we talk about public procurement, we talk about communication, we talk about creating awareness. So it is key that, that you need some, some data, uh, first of all, to improve the process, and that's important, uh, but also to communicate to the consumers why this product or this process is better than a more, let's say, conventional uh, process. Um, so, uh, in certainly the use of SCA's life cycle uh, analysis is important, uh, if it is a bit standardized, because that's another problem, is that we need really standardized, standardized methods to, uh, to measure uh, the LCA, uh, or at least to, to explain the numbers, because depending, depending on the company, uh, let's say uh, we have sometimes different methods and so in order to communicate uh, and to create also confidence uh, at consumer side we need also uh, a standardized uh, method. Thank you. Katrina, uh, does EU have a, a public procurement policy for construction industry? To remember. Um, not a separate, not, yeah. not, not a separate one. Um, we have a general public procurement policy. It's so what, what, um, although quite a, quite a wide share of public procurement is, is obviously building, depends a bit on the countries, but there is a quite, quite a big share. Um, is so that's indeed a, a field where we, can, where we can do a lot to promote innovative and sustainable products. And that's what also, why also what ca um, caught my attention most is the second, um, an increase of life cycle analysis of what we possibly more uh, traditionally, I think it's not absolutely the same, a life cycle cost um, a calculation. Because we fought quite um, um, ferociously to clearly mention in our new procurement directives that cost can be calculated on the basis of life cycle cost. But we were also told, and I think correctly, and that ties, ties in with what Dirk just says, it's got to be standardized and it's got to be comparable. And then it's got to be accessible for the companies because standardization is fine. You also need a s slight variation possibility. You need slightly different solutions to be able to feed the same model of life cycle costing. And I do believe that there is still a lot of work to be done by our colleagues who actually have the technical expertise that we are lacking. We gave the opening to do that, but we do believe that many member states and many public authorities are as yet unable to really evaluate life cycle costing and base their procurement decisions on it. Thank you, Katrin. 
Christine, in, in the German Bioeconomy Council, do you take up this life cycle aspect as well? And how sometimes I get a feeling that the council work is uh, quite a lot focused on new biorefineries, new chemical inventions. How is this wood production sector in, in your work? So. Yeah, you, you're right. It's, uh, our focus is on, on, um, on agriculture and on um, also chemistry, but we also look at different um, segments. Not so much on life cycle analysis yet, but I take that up, take that back with me and uh, see that we can um, fill that in. What we have been uh, talking to companies and uh, inst institutes about is about the codes or harmonizing standardization and regulations in the um, building uh, industry because uh, what we see is that there's still no not enough or not the right ones ISOs or SEN directions so, so to, to provide the right um, um, codes for to, to, to work on but also that there are uh, restrictive regulations on using um, bio-based materials in some parts uh, let's say there's no harmonization between the um, routes how you um, regulate um, fire precaution regulations and things like that and that they, they do not yet take account of new um, let's say wood-based um, material that goes into this so that's what we see as um, very important thank you interesting Daniel, any um, reflections? Yes. Um, here, the, the, uh, an important issue is to be able to scale a number of solutions. There are a lot of things happening. So how do we manage to scale this? And, and if you start thinking about this, you see that there, are, there might be challenges ahead. For instance, will there be enough wood uh, in a given region to, to produce the different uh, wood uh, construction materials. So in the, uh, even in, I, I would like to advocate even for an LCA that not only looks at the products, but really at uh, what does it mean in the future uh, if, we, if we want to continue to supply this type of material. And uh, of course, this is very important also because any company that is willing to invest in these construction products needs to have a, a sort of long-term perspective, uh, whether this will be sustainable, this will be feasible uh, again or uh, through a, a long period of time. Otherwise, the investment uh, from the company will be difficult and the scaling will also be difficult. So this is an approach I think that is very important to look at future scenarios for the forest and these future scenarios uh, of course need to include climate change and uh, and the uh, the risks associated with this because another dimension is yeah when you invest what are the risks that you uh, that you are taking thank you I, I will follow up that and, and refer to the study that Becca was presenting because exactly there what they did in the study was also going from a product level to scale up to the market level. And I think this is really important that we need, not just single case study products, but looking at the market level. Linda, do you have something to add? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a few words about what we actually do. Okay, um, please. Just to do a framework. Um, we produce uh, multifamily houses, like the ones on the picture there. Uh, and we do it in a factory, in an industrial way, like you would see cars be produced in a car factory. Um, and the modules, as we call them, are parts of an apartment and they are 80% done when they leave the factory and go out to the site uh, to be mounted into uh, a house. Um, and when it comes to the uh, construction industry, it actually stands for 40% of CO2 emission globally. Uh, which is awful, but at the same, same time it shows a great potential. And when we uh, build houses the way we do, instead of the traditional concrete uh, on-site production, we actually reduce CO2 emission by 30%. Um, and we know how to do this. The concrete industry um, are just starting to realize that they need to change and need to be uh, to have less CO2 emissions. But we have been doing this since 1994. So we know that it can be done and we know how to do it. Uh, so the fastest way to reduce CO2 emission would be to focus on the construction industry um, and to focus a shift 
and more to an industrialized production. Uh, one way to do that could be through the increased use of life cycle analysis. Uh, today, at least in the market where I am uh, active, uh, there are a lot of climate goals to buildings, but everything ha uh, has to do with the user phase. Uh, how do we make a building uh, energy efficient? It never looks at the manufacturing phase, which is a huge uh, factor in the CO2 emissions. Uh, so if we could switch focus to looking at the whole life cycle instead of just, um, just the user phase, uh, we could challenge the business to drive innovation and switch over to more bioeconomy. Thank you. Um, okay, please. Yeah. And another way could be to harmonize building codes. Today, the building codes between countries are similar, but they are not harmonized. Um, so harmonizing them could be a way to increase competition um, and drive innovation again, and also make sure that people have access to good, affordable uh, housing. Uh, so you could reach a lot of goals by doing that. Um, and my last bullet. Um, it could be a bit uh, strange to talk about transportation because uh, I want to make sure that we have laws and regulations that actually makes it easier to transport modules from a factory to, um, to a building site. But when we look at the 30% um, less CO2 emissions from our type of building, uh, that's including transportation. So even if we transport, we have 30% less of CO2 emission than a traditional concrete building site. Um, but the thing today, at least in Sweden, is that um, politicians um, talk a lot about uh, that we need to build affordable, we need to build sustainable, um, but to transport uh, new house modules in Sweden is both really hard and really expensive. It's harder and expensive, more expensive than transporting anything else in Sweden actually today. Um, so you need to have some sort of holistic view. We, we keep coming back to that. But you need to have some sort of holistic view because now you say something and then you put restrictions that be counterproductive because all this uh, about the transportation actually makes it both easier and more affordable to build on site. Uh, so just when setting policies and regulations, make sure that they are not counterproductive. Thank you, Linda. And then the last slide. Uh, now I make a radical thing. There's quite a lot of information there and might be a challenge for, for the commentators to, to grasp. So I will start with Daniel explaining your, your uh, slide and then ask the others if they have any reflections or comments. Please, Daniel. Well, I didn't want to go through all, all these points, but to show you, in fact, the way we, we have approached our forestry program, we start having a number of uh, meetings with stakeholders all over Europe to see what is the system and where, where are the leverage points, the barriers in the, in the forestry sector system, so which is on, on the left-hand side. And at the end of the day, our goal in, in Climate Kick is to transform systems in order to reduce the impacts on climate change or, or to adapt to these impacts. And so, obviously, in the forestry system, there are three goals that we need to uh, try to increase and to balance the sink function of the forest, all the storage, and then all the substitution downstream in the value chains. And so we have identified second column seven key challenges that go along all this, uh, all this sort of chain from producing and maintaining the sink function to downstream uh, having new value chains uh, that, uh, that can uh, tap into the potential of wood and forests to, to deal with, the, with climate change. So I already mentioned some of them, but we need, of course, to, uh, to, to deal with the, the hazards. We need to uh, capture more value from the forest products. We need to uh, strengthen markets uh, to also um, have uh, future scenarios on wood availability, uh, which require policy support. And we need, uh, for us, uh, so one of the important challenge is the need for a holistic su substitution framework. So this was one of the point of the presentations before. We, 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 we feel that it's very important in this substitution framework to look at different scenarios, including one which is 
do we keep the, the wood in the forest uh, or, or what are the management practices that also can play a role in, in increasing the substitution factor, but also looking at circular economy practices that will also in turn uh, have an impact on the substitution factor. So we are not just looking at what are the substitution factors, but actually how to maximize this substitution factor and not at a given point in time, but looking a serious and a long period of time into consideration because uh, we need to look at, uh, at time. And then the seventh challenge is, um, is key because it's about uh, uh, the, the, the divis divisive uh, feeling about the forests, whether you are a consumer who likes to have wood products or you are a citizen or uh, who is willing to see the forests as a place for recreation mostly. So how do we bridge this, this divide in the behavior of the citizens? I just would like to point to two uh, important then uh, policy uh, things uh, or, or recommendations. Well, I, I think first of all in this substitution approach there we should should have a, a sort of a support to get something that is uh, acceptable by all stakeholders and pushed by uh, by uh, European policies, for instance, and uh, we and then I, I would like to also uh, uh, argue um, argue in favour of uh, um, policies that help actors to take risks at the moment. We see that uh, in many cases uh, uh, the, the, the risk, uh, there are risks of course when you want to invest in innovative solutions and uh, the, the, the one of the roles of public action and not only policies necessary is to allow um, actors to take, uh, to take risks. We are working for instance with guarantee mechanisms uh, which uh, often combined with uh, insurance products can have a big uh, capacity to unlock uh, this uh, risk-taking behavior from the actors. And I, I believe that uh, instead of uh, giving a lot of subsidies, maybe putting in place strong guarantee mechanism from the public sector would be something that could really unlock the development of a number of, uh, of solutions in the forestry and bioeconomy sectors. Thank you. I want to engage also the audience, so now I will ask all the audience, uh, panelists if they have directly uh, a comment related to Daniel's, uh, Daniel's slide. Anyone? Christine? Please. Coming from Germany, I think the seventh point in the challenge uh, is something that's really important. Whenever we start to talk about forest for bioeconomy reasons, there is a massive um, movement against this because the, my feeling is majority in Germany at least is uh, regarding a forest as something that is holy and cannot be touched for economic reasons. This, this has not been mentioned before, so I appreciate that it's in here. Dirk, did you have? <clears throat> no, I, I, just to add something on this day risking, I think, and also a bit linked to the demonstration uh, phase uh, projects that, that we have heard, I think this is this is also crucial. And we have we have many small companies uh, in Europe, and also large companies, uh, and if they want to attract uh, finance uh, support uh, to bring the product to a kind of production phase, uh, this is still seen as a risky business uh, by investors. So, and by the way, this is also uh, shown by, in the report by the European Investment Bank last year, that uh, in the area of bio-based economy in general, uh, that uh, upscaling or going to a demo or even investing in the, in the flagship, so a first of a kind production plant is still seen as risky and there's a lack of financial instruments in, in Europe. So many companies then uh, invest in research, but then go away from Europe to do the real investment. So indeed, um, having access to finance uh, uh, to de-risk the investment, uh, that can be Horizon Europe, but that can also be the regions, and uh, that can also be the European Investment Bank, um, is, is certainly uh, an important element. I can give you an example. I think in the last call of the BBI, we had 70 proposals for demonstration projects. So 17 companies wanted to invest in a demonstration project in Europe. There's only funding, I think, to support four or five. 
So what can we do to keep the other 60 projects in Europe? Uh, this is crucial because this will really help the biobest economy to become more mature. Thank you. Anything from the audience? Any questions or comments? Yes, please, and introduce yourself and your background, please. Hello, yes, my name is Heide Bergschmidt. I'm from the representation of North Rhine-Westphalia. And I'm missing a little uh, this aspect of sustainability in, in the use of, um, of, yes, of this biological materials. Uh, point seven says address and reduce the visive behavior of European citizens. But I take it that you don't want to be forests to be looked upon only as a kind of, uh, as a field producing wood. I mean, Maybe I'm also German, maybe we exaggerate sometimes concerning forests, but there is this aspect and there's this biodiversity aspect. So what are your ideas how to, um, um, yes, how, how to merge this goal, which is also uh, the, an internationally agreed goal of conserving biodiversity, including forests, with increasing um, biological uh, materials from forests? Thank you. I think Christine's comment already reflected, but I would like to have uh, Daniel to, to, to comment on this. Yes, this is, uh, of course, uh, very, uh, very important. And in our challenges, for instance, the, uh, it's, it's clear that they, this sustainability, sustainability dimension is uh, in the background of, of everything. For instance, uh, mitigate the, the, the hazards uh, related to climate change, please for looking at the biodiversity, uh, please for uh, um, uh, really uh, looking at the way forests are, are, are managed or kept or so in, in certain cases as they are. The substitution framework, we would like to have it holistic to be able also to look at what does it mean? Not, not harvesting the wood, but keeping the wood also in the forest to have alternative scenarios and to because in the landscape this is also an approach that we are taking very much not only looking at one product but look at the landscape in a, in a given region where are the areas maybe where you would be producing and harvesting more wood where are certain areas where bio, biodiversity and ecosystem services are much more needed uh, to uh, to uh, deal with the uh, to, in, with the forest in a, in a holistic view in capturing all the value also of the of the forest products it's not only wood but it's also non-timber uh, products. It's also recreation value that you can generate from forest. So it's, it needs to be seen as at least very, uh, very, again, holistic to, to look at the different dimensions. So the key word is holistic. There was a question here in the front row, please. Hi, uh, my name is Guy Lomax with the Nature Conservancy. And I'm also going to come back onto this holistic question that's been raised many times. Um, and particularly on just the uh, the point that uh, Arthur mentioned in his talk on uh, the need to maintain the the forest sink as well as a, as well as the the substitution benefit of um, products in in the 2050 vision. Um, so I was interested if the panelists have any thoughts on um, how the the growth of the bioeconomy can best be used to enhance the the forest sink and expand expand forests in Europe. What a large question. Uh, is somebody who wants to comment directly on this relevant question, but is, is somebody? Dirk. Let me just please. partially, at least. I think if you talk about bioeconomy, it's not only the forest, of course. It's, uh, and that's the advantage in Europe compared to, for instance, the States or Brazil, by the way. It's not a corn-based or a sugarcane-based bioeconomy. In, in Europe, the bioeconomy is based on all kinds of, of, of feedstock that can be crops, that can be waste. It's more and more, by the way, waste or side streams from the food industry, for instance. And of course, it's, it's forestry. Uh, and I have to admit, when I started with the consortium, I, I'm active a long time already in the bioeconomy, but I didn't know very well the forestry, the pulp and paper area. And I have to admit, I'm quite impressed by this sector because the other sectors can learn a lot from the forest sector on, on how to maintain sustainability and how to harvest, you know, uh, forests and trees in a sustainable way. 
uh, if you, I was visiting Finland, uh, uh, and if you see that using digitalization, you know, they can really, they, they plant, I think, three new trees when they harvest one, uh, and then due to digitalization, they can really, you know, uh, they really have a nice overview uh, of, of what is happening. Many other sectors can learn a lot of, um, of, of the forest-based sector. So I would say, if we talk about bioeconomy, very important, it's not only bio-based or only agriculture, it is really, you know, try to uh, use or utilize uh, all uh, renewable uh, materials that are possible in, in Europe, which makes it more in a sustainable way, that's clear. Thank you. Elmar, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, um, very interesting. I have a question concretely to you, Linda. What's the lifetime of these units? and what happens at the end of the lifetime with, with the units. And maybe if I can shoot out a second question, uh, so is that's on the life cycle analysis in general, because if you're looking at this process, uh, decommunization, um, where things change rapidly, the life cycle analysis changes rapidly, right? So we, we get life cycle information, we might invest or buy on the basis of that, but in five years time, 10 years time, it's totally different. So we need to have a longer term perspective in order to understand what the life cycle emissions will be also in 2030, given uncertainties about 2030, and I'm not squaring the circle here, so would also like to see some opinions on that. Thanks. Linda, please. Um, the life cycle analysis today done on buildings are 100 years, for use for 100 years. Um, and at the end of that period, it depends on what type of house it is. Um, ours could be um, pretty easily taken apart again and reused the materials. Um, but we have to, we don't know yet, we haven't had any buildings out there for a hundred years. Um, but we have a thought that they should be easy to recycle or reuse at the end of them. Um, and the other thing about life cycle, I agree that, that uh, it changes the prerequisites for change, but still it's better to do it than to not do it, I think. At least you have something, uh, and you show that you think about uh, trying to see the whole perspective. So I think it's better to do it than to not. Okay, thank you. And the last question to Mark, the director. It's not a question, but a comment about the sustainability issue, because I think this is really important. And I would like to, to state that, uh, fortunately, in Europe, most of European forests are sustainably managed, which is completely different from other parts of the world. Basically, in the last decades, the forest area has increased from the 90s to here, the, the, the three times the size of Switzerland. Growing stock has continuously increased. And I think if we are facing a challenge towards the future, it's not the over-management, but the lack of management. You know, if you look now, and it was commented before, the risk of increasing natural disturbances like forest fires, bark beetles, in many cases it's because we have abandoned forestry in many parts of Europe because they are, the forestry is not profitable. And in that sense, connecting to one of the questions here, the bioeconomy can help to finance the adaptation measures that we will need in the next decades to ensure the resilience and the sustainability of our forests. So I think I see more a synergistic relationship between bioeconomy and sustainability than the other way around. So I would like to emphasize that, that the forest management is the key to ensure the sustainability, but someone needs to finance that forest management and the bioeconomy can be an option. Thank you. As a moderator, I will use this privilege to flag one of my favorite policy that was not explicitly mentioned here, but which I think is very important. And I, I come back to also to the presentation of Arthur and, and um, the, the first presentation about the grand challenges that we are facing. And can I have the slides? So what was said in the beginning was that we are facing really huge challenges in terms of uh, the climate mitigation policy. We have a huge uh, gap in terms of uh, the emissions and where we would like to be. Last week, the U United Nations Environmental Program uh, published this emission gap report. And basically what it's saying is that if the countries were uh, carrying out the policies that they uh, committed or not the, uh, the uh, NDCs during the Paris Agreement time, 
And if we target it for 1.5 degree by 2030, there would be a huge gap between the emission that we are actually putting out in the air and we should reduce. Actually, it's, uh, if you think that today, globally, we are emitting about 53 gigatons and the gap is around 32, it's, it's a huge gap. And that, that, that the lesson that I, I, I draw from this is that uh, we need really transformational policies here. And one of the policies that uh, UNEP is flagging, and OECD is flagging, World Bank is flagging, IMF is flagging, is the fiscal policies. You can uh, simplify it to the carbon price, whether it's a tax, whether it's an emission trading scheme. Uh, if you look at, for example, the energy emissions globally today, 50% uh, of the energy emissions doesn't have any carbon price. 40% have a carbon price that is uh, not effective. Only 10% of the emissions have a carbon price that can be thought to be effective. Uh, there are several people saying also in this report that the effective carbon price should be in, in the regions of over 30 euros per tonne to up to 100 euros per tonne to get us to the, the, the 1.5 uh, degree uh, target. Yesterday it was 20.5 euros. So I think we really need to start to implement uh, the carbon price. But it's easy to say that just put a tax or, or emission trading scheme. I think what we have observed that everyone has agreed that this is important, but we are not acting. And I think one reason we are not acting is that it's difficult to implement. So we need to make it viable. And I think the UNEP report is flagging many different things, how you can make this policy viable. And one key thing there is that you have to use uh, the, the money that you get through the tax to compensating many different things. And this is the route that we need to uh, go. Otherwise, we are creating social distraction and, and we are not helping the policy. This so is, is something that I would also flag. I'm, I'm sure that the panelists not necessarily disagree with this, but I, I wanted to flag this. I wish to thank the panelists for a very good discussion, very interesting uh, uh, comments and from the audience, and thank you very much. What? While the panelists are leaving uh, in the program, uh, there was supposed to be still a video that we would like to see. This morning we learned that there are some technical issues with the video, and because of that, we are not actually going to show it. Uh, we are going to give it to you, to Christmas present, in a few weeks' time, so you have something to wait. But what I want to flag is... is uh, some of the ideas behind the video can I have so in the lobby you have this climate smart forestry report that was uh, published last week and the video that we are now making is a three minute video based on that report and I just want to flag some of the major ideas behind this video and this report According to the report, climate smart forestry approach is the fastest and most long-lasting way for forest sector to contribute to the climate uh, mitigation. We have already mentioned the sto uh, carbon storage, the carbon sink, the substitution possibility. But in addition, this climate smart forestry approach is promoting forest growth, like afforestation, for example, and, and increasing the volume of wood within one hectare, so not necessarily taking more hectares for, for growing wood. Very important to make forest more resilient for changing climate. Arthur raised this also, the disturbance issues have been mentioned several times, and I think uh, at least the forest scientists have many different measures that are, they are recommending for uh, addressing the forest disturbances, and my guess is that in the coming year we are going to hear much more about this. Certainly, EFI is doing studies, for example, on the bark beetle disturbances, which is a major problem in Czech Republic and Slovakia, for example. 
For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. This is said by Henry Mensken, a 20th century US journalist, and I think it is true also when we are discussing how the forest and forest sector can mitigate climate change. To simply think that should we harvest or not to harvest is too simple to be helpful. Immediately, if you combine forest mitigation to forest adaptation to climate change, the thing gets more complicated and you are likely to need both just because of this one aspect. Then you add uh, the sustainable development goals and trying to, to uh, decrease the trade-off between climate measures and, and sustainable development goals, it gets more and more complicated. So basically the report is saying that we need many different kind of measures. The forest sectors in Europe are very different. Think about Netherlands or Finland, completely different forest sectors. You cannot imagine just some one simple policy would be optimal for both places. So you have to tailor the policies regionally. That is the message also from this report. And the final figure that I would like to leave you in this seminar is this. It was mentioned already, Mark, in the beginning, but the studies that are behind the report are claiming that the European Union forest sector could mitigate 20% of our emissions by 2050. This is not peanuts. It's important. Thank you. Uh, I would like to mention that there's now a buffet there waiting for you. Please go to the lobby and enjoy also the uh, buffet. Thank you.